everybody. It is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am so excited to be here with you today, and thank you for spending your very precious free time with me. So today, this is one of those days where I started out really excited to talk to you guys about something else and ended up with a completely different topic. So where I started was I got super excited about sharing with you all my knowledge about a drug I find really fascinating, which is nitroglycerin. Once I started really diving into nitroglycerin, I realized, wow, we really should talk about angina and stable angina and unstable. And then I got into, well, if we're going to talk about unstable angina, we really should talk about acute coronary syndrome. So that's where we are today, talking about acute coronary syndrome. Those other topics are in the works. So in the coming weeks, you can expect to see blog posts and podcasts about angina, the different types, and the drug nitroglycerin. And before we get into that, I just have to make an announcement about something I'm so excited about. I can barely stand it. So if you've been listening to my podcast for a while or reading the blog or interacting with me on social media, you'll know that I have been working on something called Nursing School Boot Camp for about two years. I actually do have a component of the boot camp already live. That is the dosage calculations course. And then the boot camp takes that even further. And you guys, I finally finished it. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. You would not believe how long I have worked on this. So I finally finished it over the weekend, I think, and I'm sending it off to my assistant to proofread and make sure all the links work and all of that good stuff so that I can get it launched and out to you guys in August. So within the next week or two, oh my gosh. So if you've been curious about boot camp, I'm just going to run through what's in it real quick, and then we'll get to talking about acute coronary syndrome, I promise. If you're not interested in boot camp, just hit that uh, forward symbol on your podcast device and jump ahead a minute or so. Okay, so nursing school boot camp, the whole reason I created it was because I got really tired of seeing you guys struggle. You struggle so much, especially in those first few weeks when you are hit with a ton of bricks and you're shell-shocked and you're overwhelmed and your instructors are throwing content at you like they're 100 mile an hour fastballs and it's really hard. And I just thought, does it have to be this hard? Let's help these people. So I created the boot camp to cover some crucial, and you guys, these are crucial concepts that your instructors will possibly introduce to you, guarantee they will not have a lot of time to spend on them. And the reason for this is simply that they are tasked with a huge job in those first few weeks, and that is getting you enough basic knowledge and safety information so that you can go to clinical and A, be able to learn something and B, not hurt anyone. So the first few weeks of that first semester are so focused on getting you prepared for your clinical that a lot of these other key concepts, they're going to come at you and they're going to come at you really, really fast. And once you're behind in nursing school, you're sunk. You are sunk. We had a guy who was so bright first semester and something happened. I don't know if he got like a sick or his mom got sick. Something happened. He didn't even miss that much school. Maybe he missed a week of class and he couldn't catch up. He dropped out of the program and he was doing great and he was really smart. So I'm just saying, if you fall behind, that's not good. So why not start out a little bit ahead? And that's where the nursing school 
boot camp comes into play. So these key concepts going to do a lot of things for you. One of the things it's going to do is help you, first of all, get organized and conquer the giant mountain of paperwork and schoolwork that you're going to have to do so that you have what you need at your fingertips, okay? I'm going to help you get organized so you never miss a deadline and you will have multiple deadlines every week, some every day. And my goal is to get you in bed every night by 11 p.m., I want you to make absolutely every minute count. So many of my classmates would be sending me texts at two in the morning, three in the morning, and they're still up studying. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with this picture? Get to bed at a decent hour. I will teach you a fail proof method for dosage calculations. This works with 100% accuracy every single time. And those of you that have already taken the dosage calculations course already know this. I'm going to provide you with seven powerful tools to decode and demystify NCLEX style questions, which will be the basis of most, if not all, of your nursing school exams. I'm going to introduce you to what's called the nursing process and how it can help you answer test questions and know what to do in clinical. I'm going to provide guidance on developing your critical thinking, which is huge and a huge roadblock roadblock for new students. So developing your critical thinking and clinical judgment. And we'll be doing this utilizing the framework that really is going to start playing a much bigger role in that next generation of the NCLEX. I will teach you a study methodology that helps you master material, not just memorize it. So we're going to go beyond memorization to mastery and application. We'll cover common medical terms and abbreviations that will help you grasp the meanings of a whole new language very quickly. I will help you decipher nursing diagnoses and learn how you are going to write your own. You'll be doing this a lot when you're doing your care plans. I'll teach you effective communication so that when you're in the clinical setting, you know how to call docs, you know how to give end of shift report convey concerns about a patient, all those key communication components, including some that are written communication. We'll go over reference ranges for vital signs and other critical findings, which is great for those of you that have zero medical background like me when I was a nursing student. We'll also go through a comprehensive review of electrolytes and all their key roles in the body because that is really good background knowledge to have when you're taking care of patients when they have abnormalities with their electrolytes. And that's a lot of people, you guys. We'll also look at an overview of the fluid compartments and fluid shifts in the body. This is really that backbone, that ground level understanding of hemodynamics, which you're going to get into more in second semester. But you will be looking at hemodynamics in a very basic way in first semester, and it's really great information to know about your patient. I'll teach you how to thrive in your clinical rotations, okay? Not just get through the day, but thrive in those rotations. I'll give you tips on completing care plans with confidence and provide testing strategies that absolutely work. And there's a whole bunch more. Those are the highlights. I'm sorry if you bumped ahead for a minute thinking you were gonna get past this. I apologize. I had so much to say about boot camp. So if you're interested, go to the straightanursingstudent.com website. And on the right hand side of the web page, there's a little spot that says, I want updates and tips. And you can choose the boot camp list or the straight A nursing list. If you choose the boot camp list, I'm just going to send you stuff about boot camp. If you want stuff about boot camp and all the other cool stuff we do at straight A nursing, then sign up for the straight A nursing list. And if you're already on there, you can look for information to come very, very soon. Okay, so let's talk about acute coronary syndrome. Oh, and one more thing. For those of you that have already taken dosage calculations, you'll get a coupon code so that when you take the whole boot camp, it accounts for the fact that you've already taken part of the course. Okay, moving on to acute coronary syndrome. So what is this? This is a syndrome of basically unstable angina 
and myocardial infarction. So when the oxygen supply to the heart is cut off or very greatly reduced, you get into that acute coronary syndrome territory. And again, that's going to cover like myocardial infarctions and what we call unstable angina. So we have stable angina and unstable. So what is angina? It is characterized basically whether it's stable or unstable, based on how dangerous it is for the patient and how easy it is to make the symptoms go away and what causes the symptoms. So when we say a patient has stable angina, that's typically chest pain angina that's caused by exercise or stress, something like that, and can be relieved by rest or taking a nitroglycerin pill or nitroglycerin spray. Unstable angina, which is where we're talking about here with acute coronary syndrome, that's going to require more intense, more immediate intervention and is considered a medical emergency. Um, for the record, there are lots of different types of angina. And again, we're going to go over all of those in a future recording, a future blog post. So the other side of acute coronary syndrome is acute myocardial infarction. You may see it abbreviated as AMI. So an acute myocardial infarction occurs when that blood flow to the heart is blocked to the point of causing ischemia and tissue damage, tissue necrosis, guys. Parts of the heart start to die. So this is what a lay person out there would call a heart attack. So that blockage can be caused by a blood clot or buildups of plaque in those arteries, which is atherosclerosis. And then these plaques can break open, they can break free, they can cause a, cause a clot to form in those arteries. Whatever is causing this clot, it's blocking blood flow. And when you block blood flow, you block oxygen. So that part of the heart distal to that blocked artery isn't getting any oxygen and it's dying. So we have to act fast. So symptoms of an acute coronary syndrome, very important for you to be able to recognize them. This will be on exams. And if you find yourself down in the emergency department, working in the inpatient setting, you want to be on the lookout for things like this, especially when you have patients who are at high risk. So the symptoms of acute coronary syndrome, the hallmark sign, chest pain. This can be described as pressure, chest tightness. There's an elephant sitting on my chest. Could be described as a feeling of fullness. So one of the things you'll learn in your adult assessment class, most likely, is how to do a pain assessment. And one of the things about chest pain is that a lot of things can cause chest pain. So you'll be learning how to take a very thorough pain assessment, which is what is the pain level? What is the quality of the pain? Does it radiate anywhere? All of those things can help you put together the picture of this sounds like it's chest pain related to a heart attack versus this sounds like it could be chest pain related to their pneumonia or their cracked ribs or whatever. So just know that that's going to be coming up. That would be another great episode to talk about pain assessment. So I'm going to write that down. And if I forget, somebody out there, send me an email and remind me. So when you have this pain with acute coronary syndrome, this pain could include the jaw, it could include the neck, even the stomach. Sometimes it's the back, and a lot of times it's the arms or maybe that one arm. I don't know what the data says, but anecdotally, it's the left arm if it's just one, but I never like to say that anything is absolute. So just know that it's the arms, back, stomach, jaw, neck. Pain could be in any of those places. Patient could also feel short of breath, could feel like they just have some indigestion. Maybe they're nauseous. Maybe they just say, my stomach's upset. They may be lightheaded, dizzy, way more fatigued than they expect to be, and have sweating, which we call diaphoresis in the fancy medical world. I want to take a little aside to tell you that not every patient experiences chest pain. So... I know in the movies, when someone's having, 
angina or they're having a myocardial infarction. They clutch their chest, they grimace, they fall to the ground, and then sometimes they die. But in real life, not everyone who has this infarction is going to have chest pain. So For example, patients with diabetes often have a condition called neuropathy because diabetes can damage the nerves. A lot of diabetics will feel that neuropathy more significantly in their hands and in their feet. It can also affect the nerves around the heart, meaning they're not going to feel that chest pain. Studies also show that women can experience different symptoms than men. Chest pain is still a very common symptom, but women could be more likely to report a symptom of feeling short of breath, feeling back pain, jaw pain, or nausea and vomiting. And then another very interesting patient audience are those who've had heart transplants. So there's a study, and if you look at the blog post associated with this, there's a link to it. So if you're interested in reading it, there was a study that looked at 22 patients about four years, just under four years after their heart transplants, and they had uh, myocardial infarctions. And of those 22 patients, only two of them presented with chest pain. Most of them were experiencing shortness of breath and weakness as their main symptoms. So the point is, a myocardial infarction can occur without that crushing hallmark chest pain. And when it occurs without that pain, you may hear it referred to as a silent MI. Okay, so we have our patient. They've come in. They've got the chest pain. They're nauseous. They're diaphoretic. They're tired. And what else? They're dizzy. Okay, so we think they have an MI. What are we going to do to treat acute coronary syndrome? So when you're looking at acute coronary syndrome, I like to go by the ACLS guidelines that are determined by the American Heart Association. Of course, you're probably always going to defer to what your instructors are telling you, or if you're in clinical, what your hospital's policies and procedures are. But this is the ACLS guidelines for treating acute coronary syndrome. So one of the first things to do with a patient who comes in looking like this, you got to get a quick set of vitals. You got to know what you're dealing with. Oxygen is recommended for patients who have shortness of breath or an O2 saturation level less than 94%. So even though 90% is normal, we want to make sure we don't get below 94. Someone's going to get an IV in the patient. When they do that, they're going to draw some labs. And we're also going to want a 12 lead EKG done right away. An x-ray could be ordered. When it's done, could be determined by the severity of the patient's symptoms. If they're crashing right now, we may wait on the x-ray, but if we have time, we may want to get that x-ray. So as I mentioned, we're drawing some labs. And the reason for this is that we're looking at things like markers that indicate tissue necrosis is occurring in the heart. Those are called cardiac enzymes. We're looking at coagulation studies, we're looking at lipid profile, and a metabolic panel. What you're really interested in, probably the first thing your brain's going to go to, is those cardiac markers. So the three main ones that you'll be looking at are myoglobin, troponin, and CKMB. So the first one that's going to rise is myoglobin, and that's typically about... 30-ish minutes, it'll start to go up. The problem with myoglobin is that it's not that specific to cardiac muscle necrosis. The next, well, actually the most specific, let's go there, the one that you're most interested in because it is the most specific for cardiac muscle necrosis is that troponin. So you want to get that troponin level. Unfortunately, troponins don't rise right away. I saw an onset as early as three hours, but most references that I consulted were four to six or even four to eight. So knowing that troponins are going to rise and be very specific, but they're not going to rise right away. And then the other lab that you'll be looking at is called the CKMB. It's also pretty specific for cardiac necrosis. It also takes a little bit of time to rise as well. So when you're doing those troponins, most likely what will happen is the medical doctor or nurse practitioner or whoever is ordering this is probably going to have you do serial 
troponins or serial cardiac enzymes. And when we say something is serial, we mean we're going to do one now, we're going to do one in so many hours, we're going to do one again after that, and we're going to do a series and we're going to look at the trend. Because what will happen is this troponin is going to rise, 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 and then it'll peak and then it'll start to come down. So we really want to know if the troponin is continuing to rise, meaning tissue necrosis is continuing to occur, or have we reached our worst part and now we're coming on the way back down. So if you hear someone say we're doing serial troponins or serial cardiac enzymes, that's why and that's what they're talking about. You also may hear people use an acronym when I was in nursing school, it was MONA, and that's what everybody called it, even though if you were to put the letters of the acronym in the order of importance of intervention, it would not still spell MONA. It would spell like OMM or something like that. But if you hear someone say MONA, they're talking about this kind of bundle of things to do for a patient in acute coronary syndrome. So we already talked about the O, which is oxygen. The M is for morphine, and then the A is for aspirin, and the N is for nitroglycerin. So the ACLS, American Heart Association guidelines, essentially say oxygen is going to go on first if you need it. You most likely will. Aspirin, if it's not already been given. So you want to ask if the paramedics gave it, which if they're good paramedics, they did. Or maybe the patient took it at home because they thought, oh my gosh, I think I'm having a heart attack. I know I need to take some aspirin. See if they've already had it. If not, they're getting aspirin unless they have a severe contraindication, of course. The N, again, is nitroglycerin. That's that sublingual little tablet, or there's even sprays that go under or on the tongue. So one thing to know about nitroglycerin, and we're going to talk all about nitroglycerin because it's so much more than just this, but if you're looking at a patient with acute coronary syndrome that you suspect is having an MI, you need to look at that EKG before the nitroglycerin is dosed. That's because the American Heart Association ACLS guidelines do not recommend it in a right ventricular infarct. So when the right heart is infarcted, that right heart is dying, you have right heart failure. And in right heart failure, that heart needs more preload, okay? Nitroglycerin is going to cause less preload. So be very aware of what's going on with your patient and the locality of their infarction. And if you don't yet know what preload is, don't worry about it. Just know, look at the EKG, make sure the provider, the prescriber, whoever sees that EKG before the nitroglycerin is given. Then that narcotic, that morphine, could also be fentanyl or Dilaudid, but morphine is most of the time the medication of choice, and that's going to relieve some pain. So, MONA is your acronym, even though it's not always in that order and probably never is in that order because that's not the ACLS, American Heart Association guidelines, but it's easier to say than OANM, okay? All right, so based off that EKG, so it has another helpful purpose, it's going to help the physician determine if the patient's having a STEMI or an N STEMI. So a STEMI is an ST elevation MI. That's where that segment between the S of the QRS and the T wave is elevated. That patient is most likely going to get reperfusion therapy stat. So they're going to the cath lab. And then based on that patient's history, their full clinical picture, all of that, there's going to be a bunch of meds they're going to get like ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, Maybe some statins if their cholesterol is high. Beta blockers are used a lot um, to prevent remodeling after an infarction. And then antiplatelet agents and anticoagulants. And then if they're having an N-STEMI, they're having an infarction, but their ST segment is not elevated or they're having unstable angina, these patients can get that nitroglycerin. It's going to open up those coronary arteries, hopefully help their pain, maybe also be getting that um, angiotensin receptor blocker, antiplatelets, anticoagulants like heparin. And then high-risk patients, again, statins if they need it. 
So what is going to put a patient at risk for acute coronary syndrome? So there's lots of things. Some are modifiable and some are unmodifiable. So when we say a risk factor is unmodifiable, these are the things that the patient has no control over. Their age, their family history, things like that. So for acute coronary syndrome, that would be age. Okay, the older we get, the greater risk we have. Family history of heart disease is going to put someone at a higher risk for acute coronary syndrome. Past history of a stroke or a family history of a stroke as well. Having type 1 diabetes is going to place them at higher risk and some forms of hypertension. For example, hypertension often is kind of piggybacks on with renal failure. If your patient's in renal failure and it was not because of their modifiable activities, they could have hypertension that is of no control to them. However, hopefully they can control their hypertension with dialysis and medication. So somewhat modifiable, but they didn't get the hypertension because of anything that they did. And then those modifiable risk factors, there's a bunch. So smoking cigarettes, just all patients, just tell them to not smoke and help them as much as you can. It is just involved in so many disease processes. Having high cholesterol, having high blood pressure, even women who have a history of preeclampsia when they were pregnant have a higher risk for acute coronary syndrome. Eating an unhealthy diet, not exercising, being very sedentary, which was totally me when I was in nursing school. All I did was study. It was a total drag. Being obese or overweight puts the patient at risk and having type 2 diabetes, which I'm putting under modifiable risk factors because there really is a lot a patient can do to control their insulin sensitivity, their type 2 diabetes with diet, exercise, and weight control. So we now we know who's at risk. We really want to prevent acute coronary syndrome. We don't want the patient having unstable angina, and we definitely don't want them having an acute myocardial infarction. So the best way to prevent this is we're going to address those modifiable risk factors. Some patients may also be on medications to reduce their risk. This could be aspirins, antiplatelet agents, statins, again, to keep their cholesterol levels down. They could be on medications for blood pressure like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, a drug called renalazine, which is, I believe, a sodium channel blocker, which helps keep the coronary arteries open. I'm just learning about it, but I believe that's what it is about. And also having that nitroglycerin at home handy if they do feel that angina pain, getting those arteries open ASAP can help. We also have um, patients who've got this coronary artery disease, they may need a stent to keep the arteries open. So they will go to um, what's called angioplasty and get a stent placed. They may even need cardiac bypass surgery. So when you hear people talk about a cabbage, that's an acronym or an abbreviation, C-A-B-G, coronary artery bypass graft. And when we talk about this, we'll often refer to the number of coronary arteries that were bypassed, like a quadruple bypass means four arteries were bypassed, or a quintuple bypass. Patients with severe diffuse coronary artery disease can get multiple bypasses. So as for those modifiable risk factors, you're going to do a lot of patient and family education. So this would be things like smoking cessation, provide them with information. Your hospital where you're doing your clinicals will likely have resources available that you can provide to them. Uh, support losing weight and exercising. So this would be getting that family in there to be their cheerleader, be their support system. They may need a dietitian consult to maximize their nutrition. They may need diabetes education if they've got that type 2 diabetes and they really want to get it under control. So that in a nutshell is acute coronary syndrome. Like I said, I'm currently working on those companion topics about all the different types of angina and nitroglycerin, which is so much more than popping a tablet under the patient's tongue.
So check back on those soon. Remember to sign up for the email list if you're interested in the boot camp. And if you are a nursing school educator, I know I have some educators that tune in once in a while. I do offer multi-license usage for schools and I'm working that up now. So reach out, send me an email. We'd love to talk to you about it and send you a demo. Thanks everyone for listening in, spending your time with me today. I love being here with you guys and I hope you're enjoying whatever activity you're doing while you're listening to this podcast. Hopefully you were outside for a walk or doing something productive and that makes you happy. Take care and we'll talk soon. This podcast is brought to you by straightanursingstudent.com. Copyright Mo Media.